Okay, back to microbes, and um, I think that even though we, we have talked quite a bit about microbes in terms of management and in terms of how we look at ecosystems, we tend to forget about them because probably we don't see them. Yes, we know that they have all these uh, wonderful effects, um, but we don't understand exactly how many they are, what they are doing in the soil, how they interact with plants, how they modulate ecosystem processes. And I said that we don't see them, but sometimes we can actually see the microbes. This is Kunamur Vegetation Reserve. It's an area two by two kilometers in, in, at Kunamur Station, that, that way. And it has been fenced off to grazing Almost a hundred years ago, we can, in the university, has been studying this site since then. And one of the really interesting things is that you can see the reserve in Google Earth. You can, if you find the spot, you see that dark patch. And at first we thought, well, that's a change in vegetation. But using drone images and high resolution images, we actually figure out that that's not the change in vegetation, it's a change in the biological crust, or the bio crust, which are, by the way, the microbes that cover the surface of the soil. Microbes are uh, the, the biological crust that you find in natural systems, are the top of the biological system that goes, as far as we know, for 50 or more meters down. And they have a really important uh, function, and we are going to go back to biological crust later on during this talk. But in general, the, you could say that this is the tip of the iceberg, okay, literally. Uh, but that reminds us that soils are living entities, and we already hear from Lynn uh, and uh, Colin quite a bit about this, and they are hugely diverse. We are only now realizing how much diversity is there. If you have a cupful of, of soil right here, you are going to have far more species there than probably in the entire Amazonian rainforest. Literally, there are millions of different species of microbes under um, our feet. And because there are more species, the complexity of these ecosystems is even higher. There are lots of interactions, as Lynn mentioned, competition and uh, facilitation, all kind of interactions that we see happening here. Grazing predation on top of the, the, the soil is happening down there. And we know much, much less about them. And we already know quite a bit. Like they do affect nutrient dynamics. They recycle the dead material. Uh, the nitrogen is returned to the soil, um, depending on microbial activity. Phosphorus availability is modulated by microbes. Uh, but we can also ask, what have we ever done for the microbes? When we manage, we seldom think about the microbes. And we should, because they are affecting the responses of our crops, our pastures, our bush that we have under grazing. And we know that grazing reduces the capacity of microbes to return nitrogen to the soil. Uh, there is more nitrogen then lost to the atmosphere. And we also know that microbes can reduce the uptake of phosphorus by mycorrhizae and, and the abundance of mycorrhizae. We already talked about mycorrhizae. I'm not going to talk much about them. These associations are really very important in terms of plant nutrition, in terms of soil stability. They may provide resistance to plants uh, to drought. Uh, so a healthy mycorrhizal system is absolutely essential. There are also a variety of microbes that fix nitrogen. Rhizobium is the one we understand better. But even in other systems, you see in, in the biological crust, in many dry areas, you sometimes after rain, you see, you see this gooey material. That's nostoc, a blue-green algae, as we used to call them. And they fix nitrogen. Um, 
they are technically they are cyanobacteria. Uh, and then there are the association with rhizobia, with legumes, acacias like Senna, she oaks, with a different microbe, Frankia. But in the last 15 years or so, we have to begin, we have begun to understand that there are complex feedbacks between the plants growing on top and the microbes underneath. And we know that these microbial assemblages in the soil are very changeable. They change with climate gradients, we change with the weather, uh, with grazing, directly because of the compaction of the soil, changes in water dynamics, but also indirectly through changes in the plant community uh, growing there. And a lot of detail about this coming up. Uh, to the point that uh, in different microsites, that let's say under a tree and in the open space, you can have completely different communities or assemblages of microbes, different microbial function. Now, in the last 10, 20 years or so, we have developed this model of plant soil microbes feedback. And essentially, this, this model shows that individual plant species can change the soil microbial communities in different ways. For example, plant A here favors an assemblage of microbe that we call him here M, while plant B uh, can favor microbes, uh, an assemblage of microbes that is different. In turn, these microbes can have different effects on the plants. So each of these species are going to have an effect on the plant that favors them and also in the neighboring plant. Now, why is this important? This is important because, depending on the combination of positive and negative effects between microbial assemblages, you can have situations, for example, that can self-perpetuate a situation uh, uh, or the established plant community. Uh, the example I have in mind is several uh, former croplands that had been uh, worked cropping has stopped and the intention is to return them to net natural grassland to increase the abundance of native species. Now, if this is a scenario, you have a native grass, for example, that promotes this assemblage of microbes and they have a weed that promotes this assemblage of mi microbes. If they are living together, the, the two groups of microbes are going to be interacting. But if you have that microbe N has a positive effect on the weed, so this creates a positive feedback. And if the native grasses promote a group of microbes that eh, doesn't have do much for the native grass, doesn't, have, doesn't do much for the weed, but in addition, the microbe that has a negative of promoted by the weed has a negative effect on the native grass that's going to prevent the native grass from establishing. And that's a phenomenon that we see in grassland restoration projects. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to reestablish native grasses when you have dominance of annual plants. This could be, for example, wild oats, and this could be spear grass or wallaby grass. And indeed, we have been doing studies that show that this is what actually can happen. The kind of studies that we have been doing in my laboratory are based in this relatively simple um, protocol. You have in pots sterile soil. So we put the soil in the autoclave, we kill all the microbes in, in that soil. Then we take soil from different sources, let's say a remnant grassland, and we use that inoculum, we put that inoculum into the soil. For control, we sterilize also the sam uh, samples of this uh, source of soil, and you, we put it there, and we have a different source of soil, let's say the farmland that has been abandoned and now is dominated by white oats. 
and treated in the same way, inoculated with living microbes or inoculated with sterile samples. And this is work that one of my PhD students have done, uh, precisely working with wild oats and wallaby grass. <coughs> and what she did was a part exactly that, inoculating with native grassland remnant soil or weedy abandoned crop. Now the wallaby grass responded very well to the remnant soil. You can see that the, the growth of the wallaby grass was much higher than when inoculated with soil from the abandoned farmland. While the wild oats did much better with the microbes from the abandoned uh, farmland. So there is a specific response of the microbes that actually in this case, because wild oats is more competitive, if the soil microbes are this, the wild oats are going to continue to dominate. But if we add microbes from the remnant, the soil, uh, the uh, wallaby grass has a better chance of actually establishing and perhaps gaining a competitive advantage. Yeah. But if that was it, it would be perfect. We can actually start using that for management, but it's more complex than that. Because we have found that responses can be quite system specific. Here is a situation where we have short distances, differences in the microbial communities. This is an iron grassland in South Australia. These big bunches of lomandra create a microenvironment. Um, and that microenvironment, apart from having higher levels of nutrients, also harbor different assemblages of microbes. So we did the same experiment, except that now we took soil from underneath the tussocks of Lomandra, or from the open spaces that during the winter are dominated by wild oats, inoculated pots, and planted uh, wild, um, wild oats, and planted wallaby grass. And what we found was different from what Monique had found. Wallaby grass <coughs> did well with any inoculum, higher biomass whenever the, there was some microbes in the soil, and wild oats, the opposite, did better when the soil was um, sterile, didn't have microbes added. So that means that we have to still keep trying to understand what's going on. We are not quite there at the point of managing systems with this, because the species and systems show specific effects. So we need to identify key components of the species assemblages. So <coughs> we need to understand the effects of different components on native grasses and invasive species. And eventually, and I, I could see this happening in 10, 15 years, uh, this could provide with management, management tools. We could develop cultures of microbes that favor the establishment of the species of interest, native grasses, I'm biased towards native grasses. And, but also, we could use this information to determine the condition of a specific site for restoration. We could perhaps, in 10 years' time, run a DNA analysis of the microbes in the soil and say, oh, in this site, we have lots of these microbes that have a very strong negative effect on native species. Um, so we have to do something about that. And we start doing this. We are back in, at Kunamur Vegetation Reserve. Uh, as I said before, protected from grazing since 1925. Um, we don't know what changes have happened apart from that top crust of the soil. So we decided to look at a cross-fence comparison. So we took this area inside the reserve and this area outside the reserve, where there are blue bush, pearl blue bush inside and outside. And we sample the open space and the soil right under the blue bush. 
And we sent this for analysis. So we did that sampling. We sent it to AGRF, which is um, sort of a company at the Weight Institute. Where they, they run this analysis, and then they send you a huge database with literally thousands of taxonomic units of bacteria and fungi. Now, once you get that information, what you can do is to try to look at the species composition. Now, this plot is a plot that we use a lot in vegetation analysis. Essentially, when you sample, let's say, different paddocks, you look at what the species are present and in what abundance in one paddock and what the species and what abundance are in another paddock. And then the statistical uh, analysis placed close to each other samples that have similar floristic composition and far apart samples that have very different floristic composition. And we did this with, in this case, the families of fungi. Okay, so it's a very, very rough first analysis. But what I found interesting is when we, you do that, there seems to be a separation. You can see all the samples that were um, in the paddock under the bush are very different from the ones that are um, in the paddock in open spaces, and the same with the reserve. So that shows that there are different assemblages of species. The next analysis we can do is to look for what we call indicator species. That is, species of fungi or species of bacteria that are associated very, very strongly with each of those habitats. The reserve in the open, the uh, paddock uh, under the bush, and so on. Once we have that information, if we also measure the response of, let's say, a native grass, we can start filtering uh, the different responses that different microbes may be producing. Um, so ultimately, we want to identify what microbes can improve productivity and favor native species, culture them, and use them in restoration. Now, we have also this a project that is a bit more applied, where another of my PhD students, Diego, uh, collected intact cores in Paragoodlands. This is a former farm that now is being used for restoration to establish um, a grassy woodland. And what he did was to sculpt the topsoil, remove the top five centimeters, and then take soil cores like this, intact as they are in the field taken to the glass house or taken from the area with, um, with wild oats. And then he inoculated with water suspension made from soil from uh, native grassland, a remnant grassland, or from the same farmland. And we planted wallaby grass. <coughs> now, in the intact soil cores, nothing happened. The inoculation had no effect because there are all the weeds are there. Probably they are in that top soil. There are some microbes that favor the growth of um, wild oats, so nothing much happened. But in the sculpt, where we remove that top soil, inoculating with remnant has a strong positive effect on the growth of wallaby grass. So this is something that we start getting us closer to some management. Now, what's the deal with the biological crust? It's a complex mixture of microorganisms. You have lichens, algae, fungi, bacteria, you name it, it's there. They are highly susceptible to disturbance, particularly trampling, but there are, they are a very important component of arid land systems. They provide soil stability, they boost fertility, they retain moisture, they increase infiltration and reduce runoff. Um, and they affect plants that are there. They can prevent seeds, some seeds, to go into the soil seed bank. They may favor other seeds to go in, control seedling germination, 
of seed germination, seedling emergence, and we have data, for example, that show that black blue bush establishes best when we remove the topsoil, while uh, bladder soil bush actually establishes better if this crust is intact. Now, I want to mesh this with this model of how systems work in the arid lands, is what has been called the functional landscape model, where in these systems like out here, when you have a strong rainfall, really uh, the water cannot infiltrate quickly enough into the soil, so there is a lot of runoff. Now, if there is bare ground, the water runs off and can be lost from the system. If there are uh, obstacles like bushes, logs, or trees, that slows down the movement of water and that can produce infiltration. Uh, and there can be many sources of heterogeneity that increase that um, infiltration, diggings by animals, logs, trees, as I said before. Now, this is how Ludwig Tongway from CSIRO see the system, where you have lots of cover and, and, and diggings and, and branches. You have short distance transport. These produce a healthy biotic crust, and that produces high retention of materials and enrichment of patches. While if you have little cover, you are going to have long distance transport, further destruction of the uh, biotic crust, low material retention, and nutrients get lost from the system. So what can we do? Well, you can manage to in move this system with, which is heavily degraded to this system. And some of that can be achieved by reducing grazing, for example, in, in critical areas. But now we are getting to the point where sometimes we need intervention, like has been done by Nick Rashid at Kunamore Station. He is creating these furrows with a garlic planter and that increases retention of water in the system, retention of seeds, retention of nutrients. But we could also actually put patches of biotic crust. Uh, in general, they are considered to be too slow to grow, difficult to regenerate, but very recently in southern Utah, there has been this project uh, where they are growing biocrust, producing rolls the same way that you have the, the lawns, a uh, roll that you can spread on your degraded system. So this is now into field trials. So maybe, maybe this is the future of restoration where we can integrate these models of transport and accumulation with microbial uh, restoration by rolling biocrust between the furrows, inoculating with favorable microbes, and managing plant soil microbe feedbacks to get the healthy condition in the soil. <laughs> I did it. <laughs>